interview what with myself. Start over. Start over. It's your job. Okay. Am I kicked out again? Monifa, we started the broadcast. Okay. All right. What's up? This is Lynn Lawson. Uh, you're tuning into the interview with myself and Mariah Dessa and Carrie Talley. Uh, she will be forthcoming to the uh, live broadcast, so we're basically waiting on her. But uh, participating also, we've got Jennifer Bartell and Monifa Lemons from the Watering Hole. What's up, guys? How you doing? Hey. What's up? How are you? Doing? doing just fine. Um, it's rainy here where I am, uh, but I'm not gonna let that deter us today. Yeah. So basically, it's, um, um, not raining here, but we're waiting on it. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Yeah. So the way this came about is, um, of course, we know um, Carrie has the book out, Dear Continuum. Led us to a poet, Craft and Liberation. If you haven't gotten it yet, you need it in your life if you are a poet or call yourself one. And um, as I started reading it, I was just like, um, man, she's just laid out a blueprint for anybody that wants to write anything. <laughs> she just has like uh, several different letters to, uh, I guess, that, well, at first they were like personal letters that she was sending to uh, different people, but uh, she's published some of them in different journals, and she also shared a few of them with us at the Watering Hole uh, at the Santee Workshop uh, in, in December, and when we heard them, we were all blown away by, by them uh, for the most part. And she was telling us about the book. So the book is out now. And uh, as I said, uh, if, if I were teaching a creative writing class, I would have it as required reading. Or if I were doing a workshop, I would suggest it right off the top because she basically talks about every aspect of uh, the poet's life, whether you're a novice, whether you're experienced, whether you're uh, wherever you are on the journey. She just has something for everybody. So... I got in touch with her and said that we should do an interview, uh, and I want it to be more than just the regular um, email interview where I ask her email questions and she sends something back. I want it to be more than that. I want it to be more interactive. So uh, we tried uh, last weekend, and uh, it didn't work. I was trying to do it on Google Hangouts. It didn't work out very well. So. Um, uh, what I did was last weekend I got in touch with Candace and we figured out this whole Google Hangouts on Air deal. So we had to reschedule with the carry for another date. So here we are. And uh, we're still <laughs> waiting for Carrie to join. But um, I like the just like the first letter of the book. Like I said, she shared a couple of letters with us at the watering hole, but the first one um, just spoke a lot to me about the things that I was doing and um, while we're waiting I'm going to just read a couple of lines from it I was like, man, let's see what you guys think uh, she has here in the first letter where she's talking about um, just getting into poetry or like figuring out what it means or what your purpose is in it so she says uh, here in the first letter, um, supposedly you missed the memo on craft and your poems will be returned to sender. Save your postage, honor your time. So she's talking about, um, you know, what I call plan A for most poets, which is you send your work out, you submit your work to different uh, traditional journals, and you hope they get accepted. So that's like, to me, I call that plan A. But what she uh, says in the next paragraph is like what I would call the plan B. She says, uh, tap into your blood, tap the defiant DNA that gives your hair such good posture, 
find a community of poets dedicated to writing and walking and being liberation. Study Hughes, Baldwin, Walker, and she just goes out this laundry list of uh, people to study, uh, other poets to study. This is your work and there are so many more to study. You will find them as you make your way. Read, write, edit, and find a way. Let the poems find their way. Get those words read and heard. Find someone unbought to publish your stuff. Mm. Be really brave and publish the work yourself. But don't stop there. Publish the poets around you who stand on the front lines and refuse to bow down. No, she's here. Publish those. She's here. Cool. <laughs> Publish those mamas bringing the babies to uh, to the reading, so on and so forth. So she's just laying out like what I call the plan B. And then when we were talking last week, she said, why does that have to be plan B? <laughs> that should be the plan A. thought that was cool. Mm. And she's here. Damn, I'm just talking hi. about you. How you doing? I'm good. Like, I, I just sent you a Twitter message. So, right, the midwife just left. My friend just came to get the girls. This is the life of a poet with two kids who is pregnant. This is real. Yes. This is real life. Okay. You know I know. <laughs> I you know, know I know, Akiri. I know you know. <laughs> I know you know. So, you know, I'm just trying to write, just trying to juggle, blah, 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 blah. Look at all of you. Hi, Jennifer. Yeah. Hi, Monifa. Hi, Len. <laughs> Hi, Sunshine. Oh. You look are like my hero. Look at my people. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> We're live right now. Good. <laughs> We're live until I, just... I pass out. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Exactly. Well, yeah. 911 on yes. standby. So I was just telling him about the first letter in the book and uh. about what we talked about last weekend about um, your plan B being your plan A. Like right. I was saying, like, the plan A would be to try to publish in traditional uh, journals or to publish your manuscript in traditional journals. Mm -hmm. But then in that first letter, then you lay out what I call the blueprint or for uh, ways to get your work out there aside from just that original avenue. Not saying that that original avenue is bad or is, you know, is too lofty of a space to get into, but you're, uh, can you talk more about like what, what you're saying as far as uh, your alternatives? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great question. I think um, what we were talking about last week was just the idea that a lot of times our plan A is, <laughs> it has to do always with people outside of the community that we work, that we live in, that we love in, right? And we're looking for this kind of stamp of approval from people we've never we've never met. Maybe people whose work we don't even know. It's just we've heard that journal is the journal to get in. So, you know, you get the journal, you read it. You don't know any of the people in the table of contents, and yet you're sending your work out. Mm -hmm. Okay. For what? Right. Do, you, do you see what I'm saying? And so I think, I, of course, I did that too. I mean, I, I sent my work to different, to multiple places, and I still do. But now I kind of look at the table of contents. I look at who's in there, and I say, oh, that's somebody whose work I admire. So that's good for me to be in community, in conversation, in a journal with those people. Do you see what I'm saying? So that becomes plan A. Plan A becomes I'm taking my work to the people I love. I'm taking my work and making it part of a conversation within a community. Do you see what I'm saying? That becomes plan A. So plan A, it doesn't always have to be about, you know, I like Tin House, but it doesn't have to be all about Tin House. Maybe it's about Black Renaissance Noir. Right? Like, I wanted to get published in Black Renaissance Noir for years before I ever heard of Tin House. That was my plan A, but I was too intimidated to send work. Do you see what I mean? Like, I wanted to study with Sonia Sanchez, 
that was my plan A. Okay, <laughs> you see, so that's kind of what I mean. I mean, create the plan that fits you and fits your work and fits your aesthetic and fits your heart and fits your revolution. Do you see what I mean? As opposed to having someone tell you, oh, these are the top ten tiered journals. That's where you need to be published if you want to be a poet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm trying not to say mm -hmm. too much because uh, when somebody talks, then the screen flips. So I hear exactly what you're saying. That's that's exactly what I wanted you to express. Um, because people, I mean, if you, I've never been in in an MFA program. I know Jen has, but um. It seems like that's what the ultimate goal is from what I've seen and what I've heard or just talking to you, Jen, and, and others, is that um, if you don't make it to those areas, then, you know, then you need a plan B or, you know, you have to, that's, that's your first or your primary <laughs> or your go-to. Yeah. Does that, Jen, does that make sense? It, it does, but, you know, I would say that the MFA, the MFA is a, a good thing, but don't let you not having an MFA limit you because the MFA doesn't define you. Me having an MFA doesn't define who I am as a poet. Or if I didn't have one, it wouldn't define me. So, I mean, having an MFA is good, but it's not the, you know, end all, be all, you know. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it's interesting, too. I mean, I have an MFA, but I always say my MFA is in fiction. It's not in poetry. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, mm. like, I've, I've never studied poetry as a, mm. how do we put this, as a profession. Right. I've studied it as a calling, right, which is different. Wow. Which is different. So, yeah, I mean, MFA, no MFA, that's a whole other thing, right. isn't it? Then right. the question becomes, well, where'd you get your MFA? Okay, <laughs> like, yeah. where, where, this is where we're at today, isn't it? Well, who'd you study with? I mean, <laughs> what are you asking? What are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, right. But wouldn't that, and wouldn't that take us back into the conversation of, of looking at the journals and just being, and just being happy to be accepted by any journal? Because you find so many MFA applicants just going, well, whoever will take me, that's where I'm going to get my MFA. The same way we go, well, whoever will, will publish me, that's where I'm going to submit my poetry and get. And this is so interesting because I'm, this, I'm the person in the room with no bachelors. So I'll just continue to listen to you. <laughs> to you all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, I mean, we, this is, you know, this is in continuum. It's, it's there. It doesn't make a difference. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that's mm -hmm. not that's not what this is about, especially mm -hmm. when you're doing this work as a cultural worker. Okay? But you you got a bachelor's, you got a high school degree, you got an MFA, you got a PA, whatever. The point is, like, why are you working? Why are you doing the work you do? What's the intent? Right? Like what is it that you're creating? What is it that you're building? You know, t seriously, to hell with a degree in terms of, of this creative art, okay? In terms of us being people of color in the United States who want to make a living, that's another conversation, okay? But in terms of the art that we're dealing with and the craft, right, there are so many ways to get to that. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to get to that, and you've created one already, Monifa, so, you know, you've created a, a, an amazing space. This is how we used to learn. There was no MFA. <laughs> there was the community. Right, right. And after the MFA, there's the community. After the MFA, there's still work to do, right? So still reading, reading you have to do, studying you have to do. That's a lifelong process. That doesn't yes. yeah. That's right, Jen. That's right, definitely. Uh-huh. Well, that leads me into um, this other letter in the book that you have. Um, I think it's letter nine. Um, I, what I did was, and I messaged you about this, Akari. What I did was um, in the book, I just uh, took each letter and I just assigned it like a a heading or a topic 
Okay. Because it's really like I was saying before you got here, it's like a it's like a blueprint for the poet's life. So as I would say if I were teaching in an MFA program or if I were teaching creative writing, I would have this as a required text. And then I would like assign it headings and then say, okay, if you want to talk know about publishing, go to this letter. If you want to know about uh, you know, the life of a poet or um I think you call it the poet at work. Go to this letter. If you want to know about how I juggle motherhood and poetry, go to this letter. See, I mean, you just hit on every single thing uh, from where I can see that you deal with. So um, what we're just talking about goes into uh, this one you have about publishing. And um, you say here, I think it's number nine. Okay. Letter nine. Yeah. You say, uh, it is up to you to determine whether you're going to consider how journals are ranked it's also up to you to decide how to direct your literary life. Mm -hmm. You might use different tactics at different times. And then you ask, are you interested in wielding power? This is phenomenal. Are you interested in wielding power and becoming a decision maker? Are you an institution builder? Do you just want your work in print? Mm -hmm. Those are some tough questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> Like what are you what are you here for? What are you doing? So what do you what do you mean by are you interested? In, <laughs> what do you mean by are you interested in, in wielding power? Mm. So wielding power is a very interesting one. I mean, I think we are all surrounded by some very powerful um poets. We know some very powerful poets. So you know the types of poets who write you a letter and by them writing a, you a letter, you know you're getting in that PhD program. Okay, or the type of person who can make decisions, the type of person who um, somehow is close to the people in one of these these hallowed institutions, these canonical institutions, right, and can help you um, get the the book deal, right, with the university press or with whoever it is, right. So I mean, there are those people who we know who are cultural workers and community workers. But they work within institutions, and because they work in institutions, we get into institutions. Do you see what I mean in terms of wielding power? Like you think about a conference like Furious Flower, let's just say, right? Somehow, Sister Joanne Gavin has managed to work. I mean, this is amazing what she does, right? Every 10 years, she puts on this conference. Okay, you don't put on a conference like that without having some substantial power, some substantial say so, right? And at Monifa, what was that that you said at the um the 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 retreat, the last day that almost had us all in tears about power? Do you remember what you said? I think she's muted. Oh, she is. Why? Well, Nisa, we unmute have to, yourself. Yeah, right. We have to <laughs> unmute her because it was Jennifer. Do you remember what it was that that um, Monifa said? I wrote it down. It was was, was it about navigating space without power? Yes. Like, do you know how power, how strong you have to be, right, to mm -hmm. navigate? Yes, yes, yes. When she was, I, I don't know. That's one of the most. Okay, you curious the question again? I got jumped out. <laughs> okay. There you are, Monifa. We were trying to remember the quote, what you said about power, about and Jennifer said the question was about nav do you know how strong you have to be to navigate a space without power? Was that the right quote? Is that how it went? I remember that. You do, right? Yeah. We got kicked off again. Thank you. Yeah, I remember that quote, and yeah, that was that was that was something powerful. It was, and so I'm just saying that as a um, as an example, like there are plenty of people who navigate space with power. So, do you want to be one of those people? Do you want Do you want to be the person who someone calls and asks you to to curate a certain series that could really put your peers on? Do you want to be the person who someone calls and says, we're having this conference, um, who do you recommend? Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be the person who edits certain things, right? You know, certain journals, like, you know, the people, the gatekeepers, do you want to be that? 
Because if you want to be a gatekeeper, okay, and a gatekeeper has a negative connotation, but if you want to be one of those people who opens doors for other people to come through, how are you going to do that? Right? Do you want to be an editor at a certain house? How are you going to do that? So then you, you've got to think, well, then what am I doing with my publishing? Should I be publishing in these journals? Should I be publishing? You see what I mean? That's going to really affect the way you navigate space. Should you be a part of what organization? Okay? How are you going to suddenly be, mm -hmm. become this power broker? Mm -hmm. Okay? So if that's what you're interested in, you've got to direct your career. So you've got to be thinking career, I think. And at the same time, it would be great if you're thinking community. Okay, not just about you. <laughs> so that's what I mean by that. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. I, I'm not one of those people. What is that? A, 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 what does homeboy say? You want to be a baller, a shot caller? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. Do you want to be that? Because we, you know, you, you have know. some stroke. Right. <laughs> Nah, you it, it's so funny you said that. I, I, I know a sister that's uh, doing teenage work. She's doing work with the teenage poets, and she decided uh, that she's just not. She just kind of said, she looked at me, she said, well, I'm taking a break. I was coming down here to visit. And uh, she said, well, I'm taking a break. And I was smiling with other people and, and shaking my head up and down. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So... All right, um, and if people have questions, uh, I don't know how people are viewing right now, but if they have questions, people can uh, use the chat and ask questions or make comments, and um, we'll try to get to those during the broadcast. Um, you have also, I think, three reading lists in the book. I mean, this is like a textbook. You yeah. got three reading three four. <laughs> like four. four reading lists Excuse me. Yep. in the book. Right. So, okay. I think. <laughs> you know, I wrote the daggone thing. I'm, yeah, there it is, reading list four. <laughs> yeah. All right, so for, for people that are wondering about the reading list or wondering about why is that important, can you can you talk about that? Oh, like my the reading, Because I know some people... Do you always hear people say, well, I don't want to be affected by other people while I write, so I'm not going to read. Yeah. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you read the letter, so you know what I said in there. It's like, do you want to go see a doctor who doesn't study medicine? <laughs> Ooh, who doesn't read listening. journals? Yeah. Right. I'm not, Ooh, wow. I'm not listening to poets who don't study poetry for what? Mm -hmm. Ooh. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. <laughs> you, <laughs> right? You gotta read. Then we carrying that one. Then we carrying that one. <laughs> yeah, and then to, 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 to be that able that. to balance. Did you go to that to be able to balance the reading and you still have to write and you still have to live. So it's like, do you really know what you're getting into when you're saying I wanna be a poet or I am a poet? You know, Gosh. well, I don't, so, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if people really know what they're getting into. Um, yeah, right. I don't. I don't know. I, I I I was saying to Tony Medina, we were chatting on one of these social media things. I was saying to him, I don't even know if I understood how much work this was. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I understood how much work. And he, <laughs> you know. He used to mentor me back in the day, and he was like, "No, you you understood, you know, but it, it's so different when you're when you're living it, when you're this deep in it, right? It's not even needed, mm -hmm. like you're up to here." And I was reading mm -hmm. in that Margaret Walker. I've been talking about this a lot. Her her book on being um, female, black, and free, and she talks mm -hmm. about how a lot of people think it's easy to be a writer. And she's just like, I don't think that. And that's all she says, right? I mean, uh, right? It's it's just that being being an artist in this country, in this climate, is very, very difficult. And you you have to study. 
I mean, there's no reason for you to be sitting up here calling yourself a writer or a poet or anything if you don't study. It's, it's, it's disrespectful, really. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so the reading... But I get approached all the time by people that say, you know, well, how do I... I want to do what you're doing or I want to write or I, I have poems and I never shared them before and can you tell me how to get into that? And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, how much time do you have? <laughs> because it's not, it's not like something you could do over the weekend, yeah. you know. <laughs> a process, but like you said, it's a calling. You know, you you're putting your life into this calling. It's not the other way around. You you can't put the calling into your life. Mm. You're putting your life into the calling. So I you see. gotta t you gotta take on everything that comes with it. And there's a lot, like you said, that goes with it. Yeah. So. For, as far as the reading goes, what am I trying to gain from it or what should I gain from it when I'm reading these things that you put into the book? Um, in terms of the reading list, I mean, I think you just need to just take it all in. Look at the ideas, right? Because once you, first of all, it's humbling. A lot of us think that we come on the scene and the stuff we're saying is new. Isn't it humbling when you read Sonia <laughs> Sanchez and Audrey Lorde and Mary Baraka and you're like, oh, my gosh. You know what I'm saying? I I'm I am not the one who came up with this with this at all, right? It's very humbling, you know. Uh -huh. or, and it, and it's also beautiful though. Like Baldwin says that thing about how you feel so alone until you read a book, and mm. you realize that somebody else has gone through this thing before you, right? So initially, I think when you're reading these books, what you're doing is you're taking in, right? You're looking who who are these people. What are people writing about? What did people write about? Are the concerns still the same? But for me, when I read, I'm reading, I start on an intuitive level, right? That's how I, I so the list that I pull together, they, they grow in a sense as I grew, right? Like the first books mm -hmm. I encountered are the, mostly in the first list, right? So, like, most likely um, you have something like In the Tradition, which I love, which was like my blueprint. You know, I opened that book and I saw all these amazing activists who were poets, and I was like, whoa, you know, these are the people I need to find, okay? Then you go to the next, li the next list, and I think Pearl Clegg is on that list. That's when I'm like, oh, snap, I'm a feminist. You know, I'm a womanist. Like, you know... A but, but I understood I was black from the first list. Second list, you know. <laughs> second, yeah, second list is me going, and I'm also a feminist, womanist, right? And then, uh, right, and, and there's always craft. There's always craft. It's just a matter of you studying it. But then the third and fourth list, things start to change, right? You start to find books that are challenging in terms of their aesthetics, like books that... Um, you know, the language is just not language that you've heard before. You you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you suddenly go into Bob Kaufman, or mm -hmm. you're reading Latasha Diggs. you suddenly looking at some work that is unlike the work that you saw in the first collection of um, um, books you should read. And so you're, I think that as you read the list, there are different challenges inherent in each of them, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think that somebody should just read that stuff because it's important to study. And then you might read it because it's important to, again, know your place. <laughs> and then you might read because it's important to study other people's aesthetics. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, by the time you get to, to Zaki Shange, you're already being challenged. So, I mean, there's a challenge in, every, in everything in, in some way, shape, or form, to be quite frank, you know. Um, there's there's a challenge in most of these books. It's depending on you <laughs> what that challenge is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned um, activism, and that's another letter that you talk about. I think it's letter thirteen, uh, where you mention um, you know, incorporating that into your life, not just your writing. And so I wrote the whole way. I if you look at my book here, I've got like things underlined as if it were a textbook, <laughs> things underlined, That's notes great. in the margin. On. And so I wrote down for that letter, I wrote um, activist poet versus poet activist. And so a lot of th things that are happening in the news right now uh, make it 
uh, I don't. I guess I don't know if I'm wording this right, but it makes it easy for people to want to be activists now, <laughs> or uh, people want to jump into the whole activist title just like they want to jump into the whole poet title. So, um, and then you mentioned different things that you have done uh, as far as being an activist. So I want to ask you, um, were you an activist before you were a poet or was it the other way around? Or how do you see that, uh, that I guess, that whole title, if it is a title at all, mm -hmm. for, of activist? It's such a good question. I don't know what came first. I feel like they were birthed at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, largely because, um, you know, it was reading. I, I've say, I say this so many times. Um, it was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X that really made me see that words had so much power, right, to transform people, to heal people. And then around that same time, I encountered that Dudley Randall book, um, you know, for Malcolm, you know, for Malcolm X. It's, it's uh, amazing. It's, you know, the broadside press book with all of the poets writing, right? And I, I'll never forget reading the words. It was a funky deal, you know, red, red blood in his red, red beard. Like, I'll never forget that. And, and and I had no idea who Etheridge Knight was at that point. All I know was that I read this, and then he was our shining black prince. Okay, so the the whole birth of I'm going to use words to do something in the world. The activist and the poet came at the same time, because I don't think that I I saw that they had to be divided. You you see what I'm saying? Like it, so they came at the same time. Um, and you know, I mean, activism is is a daily, is a daily thing, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? It, it's a daily activity. So it, it's what you're doing when people aren't even looking. You know, your 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 sister wants to go. She needs to go to. I don't know. She needs to go to Nigeria because she's going to do some work over there and she's got a Kickstarter campaign and she's asking for $10 from everybody who she knows. You know, sometimes you ain't got $10. But if you, maybe you got five, maybe you got one, maybe the only thing you can do is spread the word. You don't go around waving a flag about the fact that you did that. But it's a small thing that can help somebody facilitate change. You know what I'm saying? Like those small things or, you know, they're having a, a clothing drive down the block. Take some clothes down the block. You know what I'm saying? Take some used clothes down the block. You know, talk to the kid right here who's trying to understand something about his SAT, right? Activism is in a sense, I mean, this is weird. It's just, it's being turned on to the needs of people. Right. That's that's what it what it is and sometimes that's being in the street and doing something big but sometimes that's doing something really really small and quiet yeah and it's definitely yeah. not talking about it <laughs> mm. right it's just yeah. doing well it. in this age of social media it's like everybody is like you have you feel compelled to tell everybody like you said with okay with the kickstarter thing or uh, like a GoFundMe or something, or if you're holding some type of a rally, or if you're doing like whatever you're doing as far as activism is concerned, I guess in response to something going on, you know, but you hit on something when you said it's like, you know, what don't people know that we that we are doing? Or do people have to know that we're doing what we're doing, you know, right. in order to be an activist? Yeah. So, um, another... Well Another point I, I wanted to make. Jen. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Jen. I have a question kind of related to that. So, you know, um, Lynn touched on, you know, with all the things that are going on with, you know, Sandra Bland, Samuel Bowles, and, you know, all the other deaths that have happened this year. Mm -hmm. what, um, what advice would you give to activist poets who are kind of tired? Or, or have fatigue from all the things that are that have been happening and are really like discouraged at this point. Rest, rest. Yeah, I don't, and I don't say that lightly. 
You know what I'm saying? I don't say that lightly because it's impossible to do the work when you're burnt out and you haven't been taking care of yourself. Right. It's absolutely impossible, right? So you take a little bit of rest, you know. Um, you do you 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 go and walk in nature. You know, you 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 hang out with your friends. You do something that nourishes you and replenishes you. You cry. You know, you hold people you love. And you'll know when it's time to do the work again. Right? Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of times I think we neglect ourselves. Yeah. Right? And we think we got to keep going. And you, you might need to tune out of social media. <laughs> right? You might need to tune out of social media. Um, you know, give yourself rest. That's what I would say. Because this has been going on for a very long time in this country, right? Mm -hmm. Been going on for a very long time. Yes. I look at yeah, I look at um Baba Askia Tere and you know Mama Sonia and Baba Haki and I'm just like I don't know how you manage to keep your sanity, right? And they have managed to keep their sanity. Yeah. Right, but they 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 know something, right? They know something, and I noticed that Baba Haki writes about like never give up on children and. You know, like good, good food and music, and you know all of this. All of this, they they still see beauty, and I think that's the thing. Once you lose sight of beauty, once you lose sight of possibility, you can't even do the work anymore. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I think I notice a lot with um with Mama Sonia. She moves at her pace, and you move with her. Mm. But she moves at her pace. She speaks at her pace when she's ready to go. When she's ready to walk in, she walks in. And I think there's just something to be said about you. She gives you the, the thought that that's what she does all day. Mm. And mm. you know that that's how she deals with everybody at all times, not just um, I got booked at this university and I'm not going to let them overwhelm me. I don't think you can overwhelm her at tea at her house. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, this, and she moves at that pace and she's the, I have a quick question about that because I think we, we've had a couple of conversations about Mama Sonia. What has she done for your um, life in more than the activism way? What has she taught you about caring for people in this poetry world? You know, uh, people come and go. As artists, we come and go. Uh, you know, we meet each other, we love each other, and then we're gone. You know, um, how does she taught you to um, to love on the poets and artists? Well, you know, it's funny. It's a great question, um, Mama Sonia. I don't. You know, you should know. I don't know Mama Sonia, right? I just have all her books on my mm. shelf. Okay, and I did. I took a workshop with Mama Sonia. Let me tell mm. you about this workshop. The workshop was three hours. <laughs> There were 50 people in it, and it was about haiku. And I tell you that when we all left that room, we felt like we'd all been hugged by this one woman. Yeah. Now, how she did that <laughs> was just by being, she's full of love. Yeah. She's very clear, right? She's very, very mm -hmm. clear. And she just, the way she looks at you, the way she listens to you, mm -hmm. <sighs> you know, I you see. I just sighed. You feel seen yeah. around her, and I think that's an important thing. Is that is that you 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 learn everybody needs to be seen, right? In some way, I don't mean that we have to be on stage. I mean we just have to be respected and held and loved as human beings. Right. Absolutely. And 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 so that's what I get from her mm -hmm. presence about community. What I've gotten from her work, though, is really wonderful because there's a roundness to it. What I've gotten from her work is I remember seeing Mama Sonia's work when I was a student at, I think I was at Tuskegee, digging in the archives, and I found some old book of hers, and she was talking about Mary had a little lamb until he got his throat slit, you dig? And I was like, don't you say that? And now, right? And then you move to peace. So yeah, but then you 
Move to Peace is a haiku song. And then in between that, I've been a woman. Mm. Do, you, do you see fullness mm. and growth and change and doing that publicly in her work? So she gave me that, right? She gave me that. And she's mm. a mother, right? So she gave me that. And she talked to me about how, um, you know, being ostracized um, and not given a, a, a job because of her, her activism and how she was then offered another job and how she was putting her books on the shelf crying. I'm sure she tells this story often, you know, and she was like, mm -hmm. but in the morning she had it all together. And what I loved about that story was the vulnerability in it. Mama Sonia lets herself be vulnerable in her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she does tell it. She tells it exactly how it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you see, I just get that it's fine to be a full woman, a vulnerable woman, a strong woman, a woman who does stupid stuff, a woman who does brilliant stuff, a woman who is a human being, right? A woman who is angry sometimes, mm -hmm. a woman who's disappointed. Mm -hmm. It's all in her work. It's all in her work. What's that poem she got? She says something like, I've been in a couple of organizations fools, a couple of men's fools. I guess I should be my own fool for a while. She got humor, too. You know? <laughs> She spoke, she spoke at Bowie State last year, and during her lecture, she just started a poem. And you don't know when she's uh, lecturing and when she started a poem. And she'd be halfway through the poem, and you'd be like, oh, oh, this is a poem. Oh, I get it. <laughs> That's just, uh, she was just talking. <laughs> That's her rhythm. Y'all keep talking because I think there's rice burning on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't burn the rice. Jesus. Once that uh, I was Jen, I was going to ask this. I think that was the question I was going to ask. What you said about um about getting or like getting tired with the yeah. activism. Yeah. Because. Sorry. It's like you can't really be a, a superhero out here. Like every time something comes up, you know. Right. To be pre, I guess put your full. 100% into everything. Not saying that it's not in each of these uh, different cases is not important, but if you spread yourself too thin out before it's over, and then you're gonna want to quit. So you have to be. Uh, I was talking about this with uh, Candace also. You have to be strategic about where you place your time and your efforts because you're only one person. Right. Yeah. But if you have a community like like we have here with the watering hole, then you don't have to do everything by yourself. That's true too. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think um, this brother Sean King, who's an amazing um, activist who I've been following on Twitter, he said something I like. He said, "Just choose your role, right?" Like he said, "Choose something." Basically, I say, "Choose your role." He said, "Choose something that keeps you up late at night, and just go with that." You know, and I would say, "Choose your role." Whatever it's gonna be, you're a poet, you know. So, what do you, you know? How are you gonna, how are you gonna work with that? And is it necessary for you to be on the street all the time? Maybe it is. Maybe right. it is, right? Maybe it is. But then again, maybe that's not always the place for you. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're uh -huh. supposed to be healing circles like my friend Timothy does. You know, might be something else for you to do. Right. Yeah. Um, we're still talking with Kerry Talley and uh, folks that are tuning in. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, you can ask questions, and we'll try to field them as we talk. But I want to get into this uh, this watering hole thread with Thomas Sayers Ellis. Have mm -hmm. you guys been following the thread? <laughs> <laughs> this thing is ridiculous. I've been trying to keep up with it. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the Watering Hole had an online masterclass with Thomas Sayers Ellis uh, a few weekends ago, and uh, he was trying to tell us, uh, or he was telling us about the fragment in the poem, and what I came away from that was he said that. Uh, See if I can get his uh, quote right. I'm probably going to have to paraphrase. Um, poems are not poetry, <laughs> basically. So, and he was trying to uh, tell us that the storytelling in the poems is not 
not the poetry either. That I guess 99% of the poems that people write are not poetry because uh, it's mostly prose or it's the storytelling. So that kind of threw me for a loop because, yeah, it's like the stuff that I write, there's a story in it. There's, there's usually a beginning, middle, and an end. So it's like, well, dang, where do I go now? Where do I go after that? So uh, I think Candace started this uh, Facebook thread about that. And I want to say if, if uh, Thomas is going to be listening, um, thank you for cutting my head smooth off my shoulders from the comments that I've been making. Appreciate that. Because he, <laughs> I said um, it's tough. It's going to be tough to write that type of poem and get it into a traditional journal and have it be accepted if your name is not Thomas Sayers Ellis. That's the first thing I said. Because um, going back to the MFAs is like you're you're critiqued a certain way or um, things that you present, even if they're coming from your personal experience or yourself, then they still get like uh, hacked or butchered or critiqued in a certain way. So that's what I said. Uh, he says something to the effect of who cares what they think. And um, he said creation is the judge. He said a lot of stuff, some of which I cannot repeat in Big's company. <laughs> uh, a lot of colorful stuff, but that's what he was basically saying. Um, you know, you have to upgrade your stuff to where you're not looking to make it what people want to hear, I guess. And so he's really, uh, he's continuing to say things in that thread uh, even now about the whole storytelling and poetry thing. So, uh, Carrie, I wanted to know what you thought about that. I think... As far as the storytelling. Yeah, I think a couple of things. I mean, you have to keep in mind that your art is your art. Mm -hmm. Your art is what comes through you. Okay? And and I'm very serious about you deciding or all of us deciding who we're going to listen to. Right? Like, ultimately, what do you do the work you do for? Right? Like, a lot of people will give you a lot of theories, opinions, facts, right? I mean, you have to consider <laughs> you. Why do you do what you do, okay? Somebody else does what they do. Uh -huh. Only you can do what you can do, right? It takes courage to tell certain stories, okay? It takes a lot of courage. I love the idea that you can stand somewhere, share what it is that you have to share, right? Other people <laughs> can relate to your story because it's also their story. Right. We have stories that nobody has told before. There is no shame in telling a story. There is absolutely none. That's what we do. That's what we've done. That's what we've been doing from the beginning of time, telling stories. Okay, so now I tell my story one way. Now somebody else's narrative is broken up. It's broken up in bits and pieces. It's got rhythm in it. It's got um, prosody in it, right? It's got percussive prosody in it. You know, the whole poem is made from A, E, mm -hmm. I, O's, and U's. That's genius. That's brilliant. That's what you do. And that's, wow, okay? But what I do is I tell mm -hmm. you about my grandma in the kitchen. That's brilliant, too. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, you have to be centered in the work that you do and the reason that you do it. And you cannot let anybody else come and tell you, this is how you write a poem. There is no god of poetry. But you... <laughs> you yeah. Okay, so that's how I respond to that, right? And, and there's so many different ways to do the work. There's so many different ways to do the work, and that's the beauty of us, right? That's the beauty of having a community with Monifa and Jennifer and, you know, Lem and Thomas Sayers Ellis and um, Araceli Germain 
and Carl Hancock Rux and Tony Medina and Sharon Strange. How many aesthetics did I just name? <laughs> okay. Right. How many? Right. right? Directions. And, and, and we're just starting. And Jessica Care Moore. Okay. Do y'all mm -hmm. do y'all see all different aesthetics? Right. It's all different. So you know, only you you've got to decide what you're gonna work with and what you're not gonna work with. You right. see what I'm saying? That's that's all. That's all that is. That's all that is. I mean, that's what that's what I would say. That's what I do say. And you know, that reminds me of um, when you came to the Water and Hole Retreat last year, and you had us talk about what our visions were for ourselves as as poets and what we wanted and we already talked about this but what we want our work to do, what we want our purpose to be as, as poets. That's right. That's right. I mean some of us just want to be able to go into the battered women's shelter and, you know, talk about the experience. Now listen, <laughs> we're not gonna go in that shelter with stuff that is just, you know, I mean <sighs> You is gotta connect, okay? It's mm -hmm, gotta connect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. so the thing you read in the shelter with the with the battered women, now that's gonna be different than the thing that you read at the um the best of American poetry podium, right? Yeah. Okay, that's gonna be different. Mm -hmm. if you can write all those different things. That's amazing, right? Again, that's where you get like the Amiri Barakas, or you get like the the the. I keep saying the same names, or the Tazaki Shangays, because they can do all of that, right? They could go in a bar and turn a whole place out, Absolutely. or they can go to whatever institution, academic institution, turn a whole place out, and they can go to Dodge or wherever they go, and, and you know, turn the whole thing out. Lucille Clifton, come on, right? <laughs> mhm. Mm so, you know, it, it is very much about deciding what your vision of your work is, okay? And it's also not about getting distracted. And I'll mm -hmm. stop there. <laughs> You'll stop there? <laughs> I don't want to stop there. I mean, I, I was going to roll into that with um this other letter you said about uh the poet at work. I mentioned that earlier because, mm -hmm. um like I said, uh People come up to you and you know they're like, well, I would I would write, but you know I just can't make time or I got a bunch of stuff on the schedule and, and things like that. But this letter number twelve, you have, you said that um, you saw this comic strip and it yeah. said it was titled "The Poet at Work" and yeah, um, and talk about that and then how you made your own uh, comic strip or I thought that would be like a great um, workshop activity where <laughs> if you if you had like the poet if, if you saw like that comic strip like what would the poets at work look like to you so talk about I the, the strip and then yeah, yeah how you turn that brilliant. into something that is brilliant you have to do that oh my God. <laughs> well you wrote it that's why I'm bringing it up no. <laughs> okay I wrote it but I'm saying that's brilliant right Jen that's well, we'll it. yeah mm -hmm. oh my gosh yeah. um so okay so I just got amped about your this activity um, <laughs> okay yeah so, it makes sense yeah it does actually it completely makes mm -hmm. sense um all right so I, that's a real comic strip I didn't make that up I'm telling you what I saw um, I used to have that on the wall. I think I said that in the, in the letter, that I used to have it in the wall because I loved it. The idea that that is part of what a poet does, smell flowers, right? Um, look at, you know, just chill out. That's the only thing the poet was doing when he was smelling a flower. So to me, that just mm -hmm. like all your senses are open, okay? Your senses are engaged and you're present. That's the poet at work. That's beautiful. And it's true. That's the poet at work. Okay, but my life as a poet at work has included, like I said in the letter, smelling flowers, but it's also included doing work in classrooms. You know, it's, it's working with GED and students in centers. It's work with, um, you know, first generation college students, a lot of work with first generation college students. Um, you know, it's work doing herbal workshops down literally like two blocks down. 
Um, that's also the poet at work, you know, trying to help people to understand what around us, in the, even in this city, can help heal us. You know what I'm saying? So all of those different things are the poet at work. And so I think that's how that's how it came up because I never have seen the the comic. You know, everybody thinks that a poet at work is really a poet in repose. <laughs> that's that's what I think, and and I get that. I get that. A relaxed mind can be a creative mind, but we live in such sometimes a state of agitation, okay? Or we live in a state of we got these things that we need to do that are critical for our well-being, right? Whatever those things are. Um, our well-being as a community, that's the poet at work too. And so that's how that all, um, that's why that came. That's how that letter came. But I don't want um, poets to think that there's only one way to do this. And that's something that I hope comes across in that letter and in all the letters. There are many ways to approach this, right? And I'm not even trying to tell you how to approach it in this book. I'm just telling you, these are all possibilities. Yeah. That's what my mm -hmm. thing is. These are all possibilities. You want to smell flowers and hug trees all day, and that is your idea of being a poet, then so be it, okay? But you can't say that that's the only way to be a poet, okay? Just like if I want to be in the community doing the work that I do, that's one way of being a poet. That's a way of being a cultural worker, right? So there are all these different ways, and that's what that letter is explicitly talking about, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. For, for anybody joining, um, the book we're talking about, of course, is a Carrie, Carrie's book, uh, Dear Continuum, Letters to a Poet Crafting Liberation. See, I have it right here. Yes. See that? It's lovely. The cover. Thank Blows you. me away every time I speak. I love the cover. The cover Thank art. You. Yes. Yes, so, right. So cool. Yes, I'm trying to hold up. See that? I love. Thank you for asking this question. Yeah. <laughs> talk about how the cover came about, and I'll I'll go back to the poet's life real quick. Um. I think. Talk you. about the cover. Yes. Okay. So you know the funny thing about the cover is that I was not pregnant <laughs> when we picked this as the cover art. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> right, it's important to know that I, so I I wanted, the thing about this book was I wanted the person who did the cover art to be a continuum, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to be a continuum, just like I wanted the person who published the book to be a continuum, right? And so mm -hmm. I met this amazing woman whose name is Crystal. She She goes by Crystal Clarity online. Mm -hmm. um, an amazing, amazing woman. Crystal Clarity is her um her Facebook page, and then I think ArtThirsty.com is her website. And Crystal and I met under really, really, really bad circumstances. Um, we met because a mutual friend had been murdered, mm -hmm. and so we met at um we met at a gathering of people. Mm -hmm loved this person, right? Not a funeral, a gathering of artists who loved this person. Mm -hmm. And we connected there. All right. I didn't know what she did. She didn't know what I did. But we stayed in touch from that day, from that moment on. We just stayed in touch. And then I got to see, oh, my God, this young woman is an amazing visual artist. Mm -hmm. All right. And so when it came time to think about cover art, she does murals. She brings youth together. She just took a trip. Oh, I'm going to probably get the place wrong. Crystal just took a trip overseas to work with youth and create murals. And she's got murals all over the city um, celebrating, like, the Latino community um, and the, the black community. And she's amazing. And so all I knew was that I wanted her. <laughs> I wanted her because she's a continuum. Right of the visual arts tradition of activism of beautifying neighborhoods, and that was my whole thing. I was like bona fide. I, I need Crystal's work on the cover, and so I started digging through my stuff online, and I saw this piece, and it was called the seed, and I fell in love with it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yep, the seed. It 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 was just so appropriate, 
and she agreed to let us use it for the cover, you know, and that's how it came about, and I'm so grateful to Crystal for this, so grateful. The piece was already sold, so I couldn't even get it, but it's on the cover of the book. <laughs> oh, wow. I know, the piece had already sold. Yeah, when, mm -hmm. when you first displayed it, I was like, man, that's power right there. It is, right? But, um, yeah. Can I say one more thing about the cover, actually? Yeah. Um, it's your show. Go ahead. <laughs> the other thing, um, Bonafide Rojas, right, who published the book, um, we talked about the fact that there's a black, brown child on the cover of this book and the timing of that, mm -hmm. right, at a time when our lives, <laughs> we have to say that our lives matter. Mm-hmm. And we yes. talked about the fact that having such a child on the cover of that book could automatically put it in a space where certain people don't even want to pick it up, touch it, and look at it. And we decided that that was fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Well, going back to... Um, uh, the poet's life where you were saying that you see the poet in different places um, like in the classroom where a lot of poets find themselves but then in the letter you also say that it could be um, like in the soup kitchen or it could be folding laundry or helping yeah. your kid with homework yeah you know that's the that's a poet at work also and then at the end of that you say um, I see my muse in almost everyone I encounter. It's in everything. I don't disengage to write. For me, writing is one of the ultimate forms of engagement. And a lot of people think that, you know, well, I have to, well, I mean, that's what you're taught. You know, you have to set, at least when I was learning prose, um, you were taught like, well, you need to set aside a certain schedule or set aside a certain time to write. Mm -hmm. And that you have to disengage from everything in order to do that, you mm -hmm. know. But when you said that, I was like, that that just opens it up to so many possibilities because you don't have to disengage from everything and everybody to do your work. You know, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, everything and everybody is your work, right. <laughs> you know. Right. So, right. you know, to get away from all of that it, and then – I, I, I just got this image in my mind when I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, well, once you disengage from everybody, then the quote-unquote writer's block creeps in. I know Kwame doesn't agree with that. Kwame does. But the whole writer's block creeps in where it's like once you get by yourself, schedule the time, then you have to spend about half of it thinking, well, what am I going to actually write? <laughs> <laughs> so I just saw this image of somebody in the room like, okay, they got the pen, they got the pad, and then they're just thinking. You know, <laughs> so isn't that funny? It's like once you disengage, then you're just there, there with yourself. But if you're there with everybody or other people, or while you're at work, while you're doing your full time job, wherever it is, part time job, whatever, that's where you get the inspiration from. It right. hits me in the car, right? When I'm like at the stoplight, it hits oh. me when I'm walking to and from classes, you know. Right. And I have to keep a notebook with me, like at all times, or I'll forget any little line that'll come through. So, you know, that was that was some power right there when when you said Yay. I don't disengage. <laughs> Great. You know, people need to hear that stuff. You don't get that from like all these other places. You know, you need to hear that. I so appreciate that. I think um, I mean writing is a way of examining things up close, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a way of being, like, super engaged, right? Um, I think the thing is, clearly, you have to have time to edit. Mm -hmm. And that's, yes, that's, that's the time where you take whatever that material is that you have, and you're, you're sitting with that, and you're wrestling with that, unless you do it in community, right? Which a lot of, I mean, generally... I don't initially. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Yeah, I don't initially. Mm -hmm. um, I might take it to community if I'm like 
really once I mean at some point I take it back to the community obviously and because I'm here in New York people tell you what they think right <laughs> so you I mean oh, yeah. if, right you come back and you you bring it back to the community whatever the community is right like I'm using the word the community and I can imagine you know in some people's minds there's this one monolithic thing that I'm talking about I'm talking about many different communities okay and so then you're engaged again, right? But just the whole idea that you need, what you really need is six weeks on a mountain somewhere in Tibet to write your, your whatever it is, your magnus opus. It's like, and who lives like that? Right. You know? Most you of us. Resident. Yeah, you, you and, and those things, listen, a residency is great, and it is great to vacate. It is great to empty yourself. All of that is great, and so I'm not saying it's not, right? Remember, somewhere in this book I talk about writing that comes from quiet versus writing that comes from whirlwinds, right? Like at some point, quiet must enter. Right. But that doesn't mean you're disengaged. Right. You're engaged with the voice. Mm -hmm. Man, I wish we had more time. <laughs> but we got. I hope. I know you got you're years. I hope we've got decades. Yes. That's yeah. what I. Seriously, that's what I hope. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know that you you had to make a lot of sacrifices to do this, Carrie and and Jen as well. So <laughs> this is just. Something I I crafted up like on a not on a whim but you know I I just feel like um, if people get these if people that want to be a poet get these words in their hands I think they'll be all the better for it and mm. you helping to break down some of those uh, uh, more interesting or more complex things in the book here today has helped um, I know that how how many days are we away now. 20, um, I know, 20, 22, 22. <laughs> 22 days away. Yeah. And so, you know, that's that's nothing small to to set up, to carve out these, you know, hour and a half of your time to, to just talk about these things with us. You know, I, I really appreciate it. I can't really put it into words. It's, it's so awesome that you that you would do that, that you would consider um, us down here in little old South Carolina to talk South about Carolina poetry. South Carolina, you know, <laughs> you know it is. You all are doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we appreciate you sharing the work with us last year too, right, right before it came out. Sharing it with us at the retreat. It was such a gift. I it I did write this in the book. You all have no idea how much you gave to me. Mm. I would. I really like. Literally, wouldn't be able. To, and this is this is literal. This book wouldn't be here without the watering hole. Oh wow! I don't know if y'all mm. realize that. I I don't know. I don't think so. Okay we then. Would you say, Jen? No, I was just saying we just we just love you so much and appreciate all that you've done for us. Yeah, I appreciate all that you did for me as well. I, I will send you an article. Len read it, so you know, Len, that literally this book wouldn't be here without the watering hole, right? Mm. You I know see. that. That's right? It. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also, I don't, I don't, I think that is spiritually, emotionally, um, it, I, I don't think I, I would have necessarily committed to finishing it. Um, but also that is that is also um, materially because we were at the watering hole people lent material resources that made this book be here now mm -hmm. because we were at the watering hole do you do you see what I'm saying like brother Frank X Walker uh, yeah. said I will purchase copies of this book before it even comes <laughs> out, so you have money to publish the book. That happens yeah. at the watering hole. Wow. Shauna, Shauna Carlew said, if you need somebody to edit the book, 
I'll edit the book. That happened at the watering hole. So do you see do you see how important it was to be at the watering hole? Yeah. Yeah. This is not this not hyperbole. This is the real. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and give the plug for the retreat and all that. So so people know what we're talking about. Yeah, tell it. Okay, so uh, the Water and Hole Ride and Retreat will be December 26th through the 30th this year. Um, we got, I'm not going to tell you who our facilitators are, but we got some amazing <sighs> facilitators. Uh, we'll have a video coming up soon with, um, with all that information and the dates. But the application deadline will be October 1st for the retreat. So get your manuscripts together. And also, um, we have an Indiegogo campaign coming up very, very soon. So we you need your help with whatever you can contribute, whatever you can, you know, send out to your friends and have them give some stuff, share it, share it widely, and um, keep this keep this going. Uh, we need your support, we need your love, we need your prayers. Um, mm. hope, hope to see you at the see you at the at the lake <laughs> in December. There it is. There it is. It, it has helped. I don't know about, I mean, everybody I talked to that went, I mean, you know, you, you, I was, I was telling Carrie the last time we talked, you know, I went to a, uh, hope my family's not watching, but I, <laughs> I went to a failure you yet a few weeks ago <laughs> and I engaged more with the watering hole than I did with my own family at the reunion because, and here's why though, at a family reunion, you know, you get people that, you know, you may not even have seen in a long time or people that you have not even met in your own family. Right. But what do you know about these people? Only that you have the same bloodline. But at something like this, you get people that are passionate about the same one thing, and that's the poetry or mm -hmm. the writing or, or, or the continuum. So once you get a bunch of people that have that same passion, and it's like instantly – you know, it wasn't like you didn't. We didn't have to do like this. I mean, we did icebreakers and all that, but ultimately, that really wasn't necessary because once you started talking to somebody and you know, they write, you write, you had the same struggles. They had the same struggles. I had never met. I mean, people from all over the country, mm -hmm. you know, came, and it's like yeah. I have uh, built relationships with those people. I don't know where people in my family are going to be like in the next six months. So I should I should probably know that, but I don't. <laughs> I don't know what, what they're gonna be doing. But I know that the person I met at the watering hole is still gonna be writing. I hope they are. And if they're not, then I'm gonna make sure that they are. So I mean, you just completely build, like you said, decade long, lifelong relationships with these people. That's yeah, right. and, and you really have to give it up to Candace and Monifa for the vision. Yeah, they have for the water and hole, bringing all these coats together in cabins, middle of nowhere, South Carolina. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's just an amazing experience. It really is. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, Candace couldn't be with us. She's got other things going on, but uh, we send yeah. her best. Mm -hmm. Hope you watch this back, Candace. Show you some love. <laughs> Carrie, like I said, appreciate. Everything I'll be talking to you here and there. Um, Jen, thank you for being our coach on this one. Monifa, thank you for being Monifa. Love yeah. all you guys. Um, I guess we can go ahead and, and sign off. I don't know if this is gonna like completely cut off if we I'm gonna if stop. you if you hit off air. Yeah. I think okay, yeah. so you if you just stop broadcasting. I just wanted to quickly say thank you. Lynn for doing this and quickly say thank you guys for putting up. I got kicked out and then couldn't get back in. I've been kicked <laughs> out. Um, next time we'll do the laptop thing and see if we can stay inside of a room. Akiri, I absolutely love you. Love thank you so much. Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. I love you all too. And thank you for everything. Like really, thank you for everything. You have no idea how much you and the retreat and the family has meant and continues to mean to yeah. me. Yeah. Keep on pushing, honey. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we wish you Godspeed on the bundle you're carrying. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh,
I told you last week, uh, a weekend or two, uh, when we talked, I said that that baby's gonna come out like you know, like John the Baptist out of the wilderness or something like that. <laughs>